Daniel, if you want to chat at a certain point, uh, I have yes. some ideas maybe to, uh, to share. Um, uh, this week until middle of next week, it's hell for me. <laughs> okay. um, afterwards, uh, we can just do an email exchange and then okay. uh, that's it like this. Good. Sounds good to me. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yes. Okay. So um, we, we are, let, let's wait one minute more. Is it fine? Yes, I see, I see it, yes. Good. Okay, so I have the, the pleasure to introduce the last talk of this session and also the last talk of this school. This last talk is from Stefan Barlan from Nice. Institute, uh, non linear institute. Is that okay? Because it, I guess it changed the. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Time flies. Okay. So, uh, so what is what is the current? So in, ah, now it's is Institute de, de Physique. Yeah. Yeah. This is the the, the current name. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, not only that. So, uh, uh, yeah, Institute non linear de Nice is is no more, but uh, some of the spirit is alive. Okay. Good. So, yeah, yeah, the, the talk by Stefan is about neural network for self-mixing interferon. Okay, so thanks, Stefan. Yes, so thank you, Claudio. Thank you all. So uh, thank you all for putting together this, uh, this uh, amazing school. Uh, I've been following really, really the biggest part of it and been enjoying it very much. Um, so it's my pleasure to contribute with, uh, with a, a final contribution, uh, which will, uh, in fact, be, be quite simple. So it's, uh, it's work that we are doing with François Gustave, uh, who is uh, a colleague in Onera, in the French uh, research agency, which is supposed to connect academic research to aeronautic uh, industry. So they are kind of at the interface, and that steered us into this, uh, into this work. And what we will be talking about is self-mixing interferometry and neural networks. So we'll go through a number of simple things. Interferometry, just to remind, and nonlinear interferometry, and say a word about deep learning generalities that you have heard many times, of course. But exactly because the topic I'm working on here is is pretty simple, I think it's it's it can be used as as a, a good support to to discuss uh, some simple aspects or very general aspects that we have heard uh, underlined many times by by different contributors. So I will discuss uh, our workflow, the experiment we work on, and how we train the network, what kind of results we give, and so on, and, and then uh, give some perspectives. Uh, so since it's uh, the last talk of uh, of this session, or not the concluding one, but the last, uh, yeah, the last of this kind of contribution, I will try to refer often to the to 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 uh, other ideas that have been pushed forward by other uh, contributors in order to to make it. To, to highlight, let's say, how in this simple experiment some of the bigger context uh, concepts can emerge, because I think it's, uh, it, it's, it will happen. I mean, all these big ideas will pop up uh, many, many times whenever you try to use uh, neural networks. So I think it's useful to give that, uh, that perspective. So first, a word about interferometry. That's very simple. Um, you normally take a coherent light source, you split the light in two, half of it goes to a reference path, and goes to a detector, and the other half of it goes to uh, a target, and then the two beams are recomposed over on the detector here. So the mirror M1 is a reference path, mirror M2 perhaps moves, and depending on the position of this mirror, you have constructive or destructive interference. So that's very simple. And of course, whatever the dire direction of motion of M2, uh, you have a sinusoidal signal, which depends on how fast this target moves. So now, nonlinear interferometry, self-mixing nonlinear interferometry, the, the, the scheme I am interested about uh, right now, is a pretty old idea. It's, it's more than 30 years, I think, that it has been uh, starting to, to, to think about. You take a laser, uh, in this case, a semiconductor laser. The light that comes out is just collected by a lens. This coherent light hits a target, and whatever is reflected enters back into the laser. 
So uh, what happens is that the operating point of the laser, which is normally fixed only by the interference condition of light inside this resonator, plus nonlinear interaction, of course, is now also uh, influenced by the position of this target because you have a compound interferometer which includes one mirror here, one kind of mirror here, and one mirror here. So, uh, of course, it's supposed to be a very robust scheme uh, because it's very simple. You just have one element, it's a laser, so it's also very cheap. You don't have plenty of lenses and detectors and, and splitters and stuff. It's pretty versatile because you can measure plenty of things uh, with this target here. It can be very fast because basically what you will be using is the stationary states of this uh, compound system. And since semiconductor lasers work at typical scales of gigahertz or several gigahertz, even at hundreds of megahertz uh, of displacement here, you instantaneously reached a uh, uh, stationary state. So uh, basically this uh, interferometer can work at hundreds of megahertz and is very cheap. And one uh, important property it has due to the fact that it's nonlinear, it's actually much more expressive than uh, a simple nonlinear interferometer. So here that uh, illustrates a point that was raised uh, earlier on two days ago by uh, Claudio Conti, who, who noticed there is only so much you can do with pure linear propagation. Uh, and adding some form of complexity to the photonics part of your setup uh, enables it to, to kind of process much more complex information. So in this case, the only complexity we add is minimal. We add nonlinear interaction between light and matter in here. And this, the effect of that is that the signal now when the target moves becomes unharmonic. So you have an example here. Uh, when this target moves away, wow. When this target moves away, you jump from stationary states, uh, from one stationary state to another and adiabatically follow it and then jump. And when the target moves forward, the same thing happens in the other direction. So in some param parameter range, uh, actually the uh, interferometric signal is so tooth shaped like you see here. So it's very uh, expressive. You, know, you now know in which direction the target is moving. Is it going forward or backward? So you, the usual approach for this experiment uh, is, is very easy in principle. You just have to operate in the tiny, tiny parameter range where everything works. And uh, then you count these little peaks that you've seen before. And by experience, uh, I can tell you that this does not happen that often. And in particular, it does not happen often because the stationary states of the compound system depend very strongly on the target reflectivity. So if the, if the target reflectivity is very small, you are back into a linear case essentially, and you, have, you find a harmonic uh, response. So this is the nice case where it's unharmonic, but not too much. But if the mirror reflectivity is too hard, then you have multi-stability uh, and multiple coexisting states for the compound system, depending on the target position or the phase of the reflected beam. And it can even become worse in, in, uh, in, in some uh, unpleasant cases when the reflectivity is very strong. And life is in general not easy. Uh, so the target is not a mirror in principle. It's so very often it will be a rough surface. And so we will have speckle that will come back to your interferometer. So the reflectivity condition will change all the time. Perhaps some uh, signal shape is more complicated than these pure uh, single stationary states, which assume perfect uh, single transverse mode laser. And there may be uh, transverse special effects which are not completely described by the mode that gives rise to this kind of uh, description of the stationary state. And also the displacement is not periodic. So this image that I shown you before is really the nice case and the literature is full of these nice cases where this works very well. But when you try to add that, to, to apply that on a displacement which is more complicated, this is the typical signal you get, which is, as you can see, uh, uh, quite difficult to make sense of. So, um, my uh, interest in that uh, dates back from, from a very long time where um, I was trying to learn to, to work on uh, this scheme to measure the displacement of a piece of rocks. So these people were trying to break rocks and to determine precursor signs of the breaking of this rock. 
so we try to measure that and we try to reconstruct the vibration and the displacement of the rock surface from this signal. It was very, very hard. So that's why machine learning can help us because uh, what I was doing basically was trying to figure out whether this uh, are peaks, so you put a threshold and is it an upwards or downwards peak? Is the left side speaker uh, steeper or the right side steeper? Uh, is this a double peak or these two near, nearby peaks? This is very hard. And typically what you, when you do that, you do this classical programming thing that was uh, discussed by uh, Professor Uncini the very first day. So you know the rules, you have the data, you do your, you write your classical program and you get your answers. And basically what you do, this very hard work you do by which you try to guess the rules by hand and by trial and error yourself, you can delegate that work to a machine learning approach. Provided you have data and answers, then the machine will learn and guess the rules by itself. So this is a guide of uh, uh, why it can be good to use a machine learning approach to, to, to your sensing scheme, for instance, is if you start adding lots of heuristics. So plenty of corner cases, this, it may be a good indication that machine learning could do the heavy lifting for you. Neural networks, well, I go through this very basic definition, but you have seen this definition, this kind of uh, computer uh, definition of, of a neuron, so I don't, I don't have to, to, to tell uh, anything about that, just that it dates back from the end of the 50s, so it's really not new ID. And uh, a single uh, neural, single layer neural network is just many of these neurons coupled together and it can do many things, but not all. What is important is that the multi-layer network, this was demonstrated only at the end of the 80s, so quite late uh, in, in the history of, of uh, computer neural networks, that if you have a multi-layer network like this, then it is a universal approximator. So you don't know how many neurons you have to put into that, uh, or how many layers you have to put. They are no, not equivalent at all, but uh, it's... The question is, if you give it enough layers or enough neurons, that then any function can be approximated. So that is a very good thing, because that is why neural networks will work so well for uh, such a broad range of, of, of problems. But as we can see, it's also, as we will see it later on, it's, it's also a trap where uh, one can fall. Then what one calls learning training is just adapting the weights that we've seen before to minimize an error function. So when you build a sensor, this is why we need labeled data. There are uh, generative deep learning models for which you don't need to have labeled data because the network is able to learn by itself some stuff. That's, that's a very interesting approach, but for sensing when you want to your, your network to face the real world, you'd better show it a little bit of the real world. So this is why you need labeled data. And there is a trap uh, also in what you do, what kind of data you show. Another uh, concept that uh, when, another name that one hears often, what one hears, hears often in this, in this context is that of statistical modeling. And this is called like this, really, it's complete analogy with physical modeling. So uh, instead of building your model on the basis of first principle or your understanding of the system and so on, you build a model which is based completely on empirical observations. But it's a key that it's modeling. So that will also be a point that we will try to think about in the, we will try to illustrate in this, uh, in this specific application of, of deep learning. And deep learning is just training a neural network with many, many layers. That what is what one refers with depth. So the workflow you will typically use is to define first a question and you have to define it wisely. Um, here, the question we will ask is uh, of the regression type. So you, you remember there is different kind of problems that you can address with machine learning. You can try to classify or to clusterize things. Here we try to just answer to a regression question, which is how much did our target move during a prescribed time interval? We will see that physics is actually inside, uh, it's hidden inside this statement and we have, to, we have to be careful with the way we ask the question or we want the network to, to, to give an answer to us. Then we prepare an experiment and we take training data, interferometric signal on one side and independently a measure of the displacement. Then you design a network that you suppose is able to answer your question that comes from uh, first reading books about that and then 
some experience, on hands experience. Then you train the network on this known data. And here you aim at accuracy. So your network should be able to um, reproduce very well your, your training data. This is, this is called accuracy. And then you test the network on totally unknown data. And here you aim at generalization. And there is a tension between these two uh, ideas because it's, it's kind of easy to be accurate, but you have to keep it able to generalize. We will see how that works. So we've seen uh, in, in here uh, some, some uh, experiments that uh, have been uh, called experimental, uh, sorry, deep, deep uh, extreme uh, deep learning uh, or extreme learning machines. Here, I don't know whether that qualifies, but I can tell for sure that this is extreme lockdown experimental research. So this is my lab uh, or was my lab at that time. And you see it's extremely simple. So you have here a laser the laser beam uh, is steered by this mirror and it will hit this target. The target is a speaker, which is was pulled from a PC computer, but is still driven by a sound card. Then the light that is reflected back on this speaker, a tiny part, comes back into the laser. The laser is driven by this power supply. And with a very simple amplifier, we amplify the voltage at the uh, across the laser diode here. And we amplify that and we measure it with an oscilloscope. So this is a typical data set. The blue trace corresponds to the position of the speaker, which is set by the tension we apply on the speaker by the computer. And the uh, pink trace is the interferometric signal. So now we get plenty of training data. And then, then uh, things start to get uh, interesting. So, we want to reconstruct arbitrary trajectories because we want to make a sensor. So we want to make a sensor that will be able to guess, to reconstruct any kind of trajectory. Uh, and we set as a question that we want our all trajectories to be confined within a 10 to 100 Hertz uh, spectrum. That is only because this is the only range where uh, actually my uh, test target here is is able to operate linearly. It's non-linear otherwise. And so that would make it things very messy. So I cannot calibrate properly this displacement. So we set this range for purely limitations of this very crude version of the of the experiment. And then we prepare a training set, which is deliberately very limited. So we take only sinusoidal displacements. We take only a set of 20 discrete frequencies that are evenly spaced over the uh, continuous spectrum that we have here. We take only five discrete amplitudes from very small to the largest the uh, computer uh, sound card can do. And we take six different alignment conditions. So these are six examples. Uh, so you have here a signal which would be nice that uh, this is the typical thing you would be happy to process. Here you have a signal which is a little bit different, it's a bit more noisy. Here you have a signal where there is this secondary peak that you don't really know where it comes from. Uh, here this secondary peak is much more visible. Here the signal is truly not very pleasant. This one is quite not too bad, but then it's a bit shallow, you know. It's hard to recognize where is the, 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 the steep edge and where is the, the, the non-steep edge, so it's not that easy. And what normally people do when, when they do this kind of experiment is uh, they try to separate all these cases. So they will build heuristics. So they will have an algorithm that will decide, are we in this case or are we in that case? And depending on the case you are in, you will try to process your data differently in order to count these peaks and add half wavelengths, subtract half wavelengths to your displacements. So we try to take a, a completely different uh, approach and we'll use the neural network to do all that. So all these time series are then split into tiny segments of 256 time steps. So this is, for example, a small se segment. And to each segment, we associate one displacement. How much was the displacement within this uh, time frame? So as orders of magnitude, we have 2.5, 10 to the 5 segments, which is not a huge data set, but it appears to be suffi sufficient. Why do we take a, a limited uh, training set? Well, because we want to make sure that our network is able to generalize. So if I show it, if I show my network plenty of sinusoidal traces, it will just learn all sinusoidal traces if it's big enough, and then it will only be able to reproduce sinusoidal traces. So we take this very limited set to make sure that our network can do that, 
and hopefully it can do something more complicated as well and hopefully something of uh, arbitrary complexity. Then you design the network topology. So here we want to process um, data which takes place in time. So as has been said several times during this, uh, this school, recurrent neural networks would be in principle very good to do that because recurrent neural networks know have a, uh, an understanding, a kind of understanding of what is far distant past and recent past. And so they're in principle very good at, at learning the, the, the near future, for instance. But here in our case, uh, the kind of distant past within, within the small interval is just as important as the, as, the, as the recent past, because we just want to know how much did the, the system move within this time uh, interval. So basically what we are trying to, to do is to identify patterns, these kind of peaks we've seen before. So for uh, identifying these kind of shapes, what works well is convolutional neural networks. Uh, it was uh, discussed uh, in, the, in the previous uh, contribution that uh, uh, they are sensitive to shapes. So basically here what we do is we stack convolutional neural networks and max pooling networks. So you operate a convolution and then you look at what are the shapes that, that uh, optimize some form of convolution. That, and you stack many of these on top of each other and that allows you to learn, to learn features of different sizes. And typically when you mix convolutional neural networks and max pooling, which is basically finding the heaviest components of your convolution, uh, what you get is a network which is sensitive to shapes without being sensitive to positions. So if I have one of these peaks, then that means that there was a half wavelength displacement and I don't care whether it was at the beginning or at the end. It was within my time interval, so half wavelength has moved. And if the displacement is very fast, then I will have very narrow peaks. If the displacement is, is slow, then I will have larger peaks. So this is why uh, stack of convolutional neural networks is, is probably interesting. And at the end, uh, there is these uh, two layers of fully connected uh, layers that are just meant to uh, convert the patterns which are isolated by the convolution part into a single number. So these do the regression task uh, for our network. So in total, that's uh, 50,000 weights that have be uh, have to be optimized so that looks that looks huge to me in in principle because if you consider that basically what we are doing is fitting a function and uh so you have to descend descend the gradient in 50 57 thousand directions that's kind of huge but in fact it this is a small network for what is called deep learning it is very very small network so then once you, once you have designed your architecture, you train it by gradient descent. So you show it the collection of signal and truth, compute the errors, modify the weights, and you iterate this process. And this process is very easy because the computer does it uh, for you. So this is computer science and computer, computer engineering people. They have built fantastic tool that you can use for that. Where you enter is first in the design of the network and then its optimization. This is called the hyperparameters optimization. So for instance, you can wonder what is the kernel size of your uh, convolutional neural network? So what size of pattern you want to move around your time series uh, to, to find this? And these parameters change the efficiency of your training and so on and so forth. So it takes a lot of time. So that's why you have to be aware uh, the kind of times it takes. Uh, so uh, as co it, it, this is a small network, so it's not uh, like uh, car consumption that uh, Daniel was mentioning a few minutes ago. It's quite cheap. It's about 10 minutes on a cheap GPU. It's four, time more, four times more on CPU. The point is that you do that many, many times. It's actually a, a very uh, time consuming process, especially if you're not very experienced. The first attempts take, take lots of time. Now, once you have, during this process, you optimize your network and, and its train, and this is what you aim at. You aim at this accuracy situation. So this is an example of a uh, time series, which is not part of the training set, uh, but it's very similar in the sense that it com it's composed of the amplitudes which were shown to the network and the frequencies which were shown to, shown to the network. So the blue trace is the truth and the orange is what the network reconstructs from a typical signal, which is here. So this uh, is this situation. 
this here is this situation and this here is this situation. So you see these are different alignment conditions, the peaks are more or less sharp, the frequency of the signal is different, the amplitude is also different, so that makes it that the system works. But it's not too surprising. We, uh, we have to be careful that we did not uh, fall into the universal uh, approximator traps. That is, uh, if we build a network which is large enough, it will be able to completely learn all the data, all the features of the data, and it will just reproduce it perfectly. But it's not supposed to learn the data. It's supposed to model the data. It's not the same. It is an abstraction. It is, it is not supposed to memorize all your data. It is uh, supposed to make an abstraction of it, just like when we do a physical model. So the question remains whether it can reconstruct truly unknown patterns. And the fact is, yes, it does. Here you have an example. So we now uh, prepare a displacement pattern which is extremely different. So we uh, apply to, the, to our uh, computer speaker a signal which is a Gaussian noise with Fourier filtering in the prescribed band. So basically the speaker is moving randomly uh, and uh, we apply even two different alignment conditions so that we have a different geometric shapes of the interferometric signal within this experiment. And these two series are con concatenate, concatenated here. So here on the left side, we have one uh, situation, right side, the other situation, the connection is here at 100. And you see the blue is truth, orange is reconstruction. It's really almost perfect. This is a zoom on the central part. So where the two signals are connected there is something non-physical happened, really it's the, the traces are disjoint, so that's why the network cannot guess that properly. But you see that both on the left side and on the right side, the reconstruction is really, is really excellent. And this in spite of being in very different alignment conditions. And this uh, piece of trace is actually what corresponds to this signal. So you see, uh, even by eye, it would have been extremely difficult to actually guess that this is the uh, target displacement. So here we have uh, an excellent news because we now know that the network also reconstructs uh, extremely well uh, traces which are arbitrarily complex and which have never seen, uh, never been seen at all during training. So it can generalize the features it has learned to new contexts. And this is one of the key uh, strengths of uh, statistical modeling, which is similar to that of um, of physical modeling. It's, ju it's just ju not just about learning, it's about really uh, creating abstractions. It's modeling. Now, there was a question that was raised uh, by one of the uh, one person in the audience, uh, Bennett Fisher, uh, three days ago. He asked uh, to Gori after, after the talk of Goeri, he, he asked, How robust is that? to changes in your experimental conditions? And I think it's, it's a critical point. So it's a point where one has to be careful. So to address that, what we did is uh, we built an almost twin experiment. So uh, basically I, I, I asked Francois, can you try to, uh, to perform an experiment like this one and send me some data? So it's the same principle. It's a semiconductor laser which hits a target which is moving but everything else is different. So the different displacement pattern is different. It's not the same laser type. The wavelength is different. The operating point is different. Focusing condition, the type of target, uh, distance, the electronics, everything is different. As an, as an experimentalist, you know that when you try to reproduce an experiment, you start from the same principle, but very often uh, small details make quite a difference. And in spite of that, you see that uh, the reconstruction is excellent. So true displacement is blue and orange is what the network guessed from the interferometric signal. So it's very, very good. And what is uh, very interesting is that it's very good without any kind of post-processing. And that is because uh, the network, the initial network was trained in units of lambda per 256 uh, time steps. But it does not know what lambda is, and it does not know what this dt is. So basically what we have done is that we have transferred this network to another experiment, and it has worked. The only way, uh, the only difference appears in how you put the axis here. It can be milliseconds or microseconds, 
This depends on your dt. And here we even keep lambda. You can multiply it by uh, one or two microns of half, half micron if you want. But what is really important is that the same neural network has been able to process very, very different data sets. So it's different frequency range, different wavelengths, everything is different. It has done very good work because, uh, so here this is a zoom on, uh, yeah, on this part around 10, 11. Um, and this is the corresponding interferometric trace. And we see that uh, Francois was working in a different uh, alignment condition with, uh, or operating condition with respect to the one I was using. And so in his case, there are plenty, there is a lot of uh, hysteresis in the behavior of the laser. So here the system is uh, jumping back, back and forth under the influence of noise between different external cavity modes, between resonant states. Uh, and uh, this did not appear, or essentially, I think, did not appear in my training data. And this was, if in fact, uh, essentially ignored by the network. This was filtered out. While if you do a simple thing, you will probably count these as jumps. So that's very good. But still, it's not perfect. You see it well on this, uh, on this curve in particular. You see that the orange curve is a little bit more wiggly than the blue curve. So it shakes a little bit too much. So probably this comes from the fact that uh, our network is actually a little bit too big and it has learned all the interesting physics, but it has also learned some of the less interesting physics. Most probably it has learned a little bit of the response of my amplifier, which is different from the response of the other amplifier in the other experiments. So I think this is the key here. This is, I think, the most uh, biggest difference. So the take home message of, of that is uh, about modal capacity and uh, a universal approximation. So uh, your neural network should be as big as needed because you want it to reconstruct correctly your traces, but it should, it should not be too big because if it's too big, then it will learn useless stuff. So one, one uh, uh, kind of uh, one known example is if you try to split uh, uh, images or to, to make a separation between cats and dogs in images, to make categories. And if for some reason there is a bicycle in the corner of the image of the cats or a few bicycles, then the network which is big enough will immediately or sooner or later, it will catch this as a part of truth. And whenever it will see a bicycle, it will say this is a cat. So there are technical ways to avoid that, uh, typically by adding uh, dropout layers which basically means that when you train your network, you also teach it to ignore randomly some of the weights it has learned. And that helps in uh, washing out less relevant features. Uh, but this may not work very well when, so it works only well if you are really sure that your training set uh, is statistically correctly uh, matched to your final uh, set for the operation of your network. And this is something which is easy to, to do when you work with pre-prepared data sets. So for example, it's a trap in which you will hardly fall if you use the, this dig digit uh, MNIST data set of, of, of digits. You know, uh, this is a finite data set. So to some extent, with the learning of your network and your own learning that you do when you iterate on the training of your network, in the end, it's it's hard to it's hard to make a mistake. But this uh, is a trap you can fall in if you forcibly, as for a sensor, have a, a, a kind of data which is limited as compared to the real world data that you will have to to to, to work on. So uh, one other good news is that, uh, as we will see here, the, the neural network is very, very good with respect to noise. So here what we do is we add detection noise to the uh, interferometric trace and we see how it, well it works. So here the noise we add to the measured signal is uh, in units of the standard deviation of the interferometric signal itself. So standard, the, the signal has a standard deviation of one and we add Gaussian white noise of uh, density sigma, or one here. So for very low, low noise, the mean error and the root mean square error are both very small, but when noise grows, it starts breaking, but it breaks when the noise is really huge. So when the noise is of the order of the signal. And you have that uh, in terms of an error uh, in lambda per millisecond or a correlation coefficient between the reconstruction and the known truth for about the unknown data. 
uh, so about the complex signal. And you see here the correlation coefficient, it's extremely high, it's above 0.9 and above 0.8 up to 0 0.7 sigma, and then it drops when sigma uh, noise goes beyond one. So you have here an example uh, of the uh, trace which is reconstructed, you see it's very, very good, and it's very good in spite of the signal being extremely, extremely dirty. So the way you can achieve that pretty easily with a neural network is to actually add noise to your training data. This is a procedure which is known as data augmentation, and it has the effect of uh, augmenting and growing your data set artificially at very low costs. Um, and random noise is not learnable, of course, because it changes all the time. So that will help uh, your network learning what is not noise. So that is a helpful trick, and in this case, uh, our network was much less efficient before we added uh, noise to the training data. And what one should mention that simple Fourier filtering here would not work very well, because if you take the data, uh, the original data, like, like this one, you see that there are plenty of sharp edges. And this is one of the reasons this data is messy to process, and, and, and people have been struggling it for some time. It's because since it's a bit spiky, the spectrum of even a slow displacement, the, the, the signal is, is very broad in, in spectrum. So it's not very amenable to simple uh, Fourier, uh, Fourier processing. Sorry, I got lost in my slides. Let me go back to there. Yeah, so here we are at noise. So yes, the, the, the key point is that the neural network can very efficiently learn to eliminate noise from the, from the measurement signal. Now, one question is, can we still improve that? Uh, this is another trap where we kind of fell. Uh, so you see that the largest displacement are not very well reproduced. This is true here, this is true here, this is true here. We can analyze that here with more precision. This is the true displacement, and this is the prediction error, the prediction of the network, and this would be perfect prediction. So the blue points are not perfect prediction, it's very, very good, but it saturates above uh, around 2.5 and minus 2.5 lambda per, per millisecond. And we can trace that back to our training set, which was um, not uh, prepared perhaps well enough, in the sense that statistically you see that we have many, many displacements within this range, but here uh, beyond 2.5 we have very, very few samples. So that means that the network basically has never seen anything or very seldomly seen something above 2.5 and it has not learned. So it cannot really identify these patterns. So that is one, uh, one point. Uh, when we want to go to the open sea of uh, real-world data, that means that we have to make sure that the training set really has all the features we, we want to learn. And so it's kind of um, a tricky aspect is how will we specify in the end the performance of our compound system. So now I have checked that beyond 2.5 it does not work well, and this is why it does not work well. It was not tra trained well enough in this range. So now uh, I, I'd like to go back to, to the start, that now that I've shown that it kind of works. Uh, I would like to go back to, to, to the start. So it was about asking the right question. So this is one of our initial attempts. This is the signal you have, uh, the interferometric signal, you don't see much. The blue is the true position and the orange is the position that was reconstructed by the network. And this is a zoom over some part of this trace. This is the interferometric signal, blue is truth and orange is position. So it kind of works in the sense that you recognize something that goes up and then down, here it goes up and down, here there is this shape and it goes down and up, it goes down and up, it works, but there are these discontinuities in the prediction. And uh, this comes from the fact that this is the typical model that you use, physical model that you use to model this experiment. So it's basically laser, a semiconductor laser equations. This is uh, the atomic part, this is the light part, and the light matter interaction is supplemented by this feedback term. This is the so-called Lankobayashi equation, where you have a term of uh, the field in terms of a delayed variable for the time it took for the field to go to the target and come back, and the phase term which corresponds to the precise position uh, of, the, of the target. So when you consider stationary states, 
this term is just like e of t and it's the tau does not count and obviously this you see that this will be periodic with respect to tau so that means that the absolute distance is not encoded in the physics of this system at least on short variation when variations are much larger it, it answers again but here that is very important the distance is not encoded so basically the network can somehow reproduce these things but it not, does not know where the curve has to be put so the way out of that is to uh, learn the correct feature so uh, here we have uh, the case of uh, learning position, and here we have the case of learning the derivative of position. So it's exactly the same network, it's exactly the same training set, and it's the same, uh, it's not the same data set for, for testing here, but it's the same kind of things. And you see that here it's uh, quite wrong, while here it works extremely well. So that is a very in important point is that uh, if your network is big enough and trained enough, it will learn even very delicate features, but they must exist. Uh, and and that is uh, where physics get, gets in. It really is your guide for uh, designing a neural network and asking the right question. So that takes me to the summary of this, uh, of this uh, contribution. Um, so here the paper has been recently uh, accepted that, that it's now for now this version is on the archive and it's 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 okay. Uh, what we find out is that it works really really well. Uh, I think it's interesting because we see that training it in a 10 to 100 hertz uh, for free brings us something that will work in the 10 to 100 megahertz band thanks to the physics of the system and to the way you design the question you ask to the network and you process the data. We've seen that it works across experiments and it's very robust with respect to noise. So the, I think the, the paper is interesting because uh, we give lots of details of, on, on how we design all that and how we think, why we think it works or this doesn't work and so on. So it's, uh, I think it's mostly for, yeah, it, it could be an interesting basis, let's say, to learn how to operate neural networks inside uh, uh, a nonlinear optics experiment. So now we plan to do, to do, of course, many other things with that uh, beyond simple displacement measurements. So, of course, we can measure refractive index variation. We'd like to apply that to mechanobiology, to spectrometry. And uh, one particularly interesting point is to use fancier sources. So, as I said in the beginning, there is only so much you can do with a very simple linear setup, optical setup, simple setup. And if you're... Uh, photonic part grows in complexity, uh, then it can it will be able to process uh, much more complex information. So here one, one point will be to use fancier sources, for instance, multi-transverse mode sources, which will hopefully, uh, thanks to neural networks, be able to perform target identification, detect in-plane motion of a target, or contribute to high availability measurements. More in general, I think there is a lot of uh, potential for complex photonics and, and neural networks. So here we have uh, discussed a lot about hybrid systems. And uh, I think it fits very well with the idea that it's been known for many years that systems near instabilities or with high number of uh, available states or complex systems, they are, they are thought to be useful as potential sensor. But what is very hard is to actually to make sense of the signal they send you because you see that something happens in the signal they send, but how do you translate that into something meaningful? And this is where uh, artificial neural networks uh, really, really shine, I think. It can be pretty, pretty useful. Now there are, give me one more minute, please, Claudio, if you, if you, <laughs> if you agree, uh, a couple of perspectives that I would like to discuss to, to get back to, 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 to main to big questions that have been addressed. So first, you need uh, physical modeling. That was a question that was raised by uh, Professor Uncini the very first day during the very first talk. And it's, of course, a mind-puzzling uh, question. He was very right to ask the question, and he was very right that we don't have the answer. But I want to give a piece of answer. So physics guides you to ask the right question. And uh, in particular, it's very useful to, to use all the knowledge you have, a domain expert, to feed the correct data to your network. So there is no need to include the face of the moon, but uh, including room temperature can be useful. And this is uh, your job as a physicist to, to use this part. 
Now, the, where uh, neural networks really shine is where they do the dirty work. That's an idea that was put forward by Nathan Kutz also with his crazy machine. You know, he has this crazy machine that was trying to equilibrate an inverted pendulum, an in unstable pendulum. And if you put only a simple model of physics, it, doesn't, it does not work. But if you add some machine learning on top of that, then it works. That is because you can let the neural network figure out the tedious details. So there is a kind of diminishing return on investment in physics. So as a physicist, you are very happy once you have the big picture. The details are really a mess to learn and more and much more and more complicated to model. So perhaps you can just let uh, neural networks do that for you. But still, I think uh, we should not uh, the neural network outweigh completely the, the physics part. Last point, uh, perspective about another point, which was raised by Darko Zibar uh, in the middle of the week, I think. He said very rightly, uh, is your question amenable to artificial neural networks? Because people are using, uh, let's say, machine learning more globally to, to, to many points. And uh, so my, I would like to address the specific case of artificial neural networks, because this is what I got interested in. I completely agree with what uh, Darko said, but I would like to provide another perspective, which is, uh, there is certainly in your experiment some aspect which is amenable to be addressed by a neural network. So that means you should choose it wisely, but probably there is some space. And in particular, uh, if you run an experiment, most, most probably it's the only of its kind, or there are very few experiments like this in, in the world. So uh, as Diederik said this morning, if you uh, do something new, that no one has ever done, it, it has some interest. So if you use an artificial neural network wisely and use it on some unknown aspect, then it's research and it's interesting in, 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 on its own. So if your experiment is hard to stabilize, perhaps it can even become a sensor, that would be the rewarding part. But for especially for, for uh, students, um, even if it, it does not turn out to be something great in terms of research, I think that learning the tool will be something very useful uh, whether you keep in academia or go to, to else, uh, to other, to and more industrial ventures, I think uh, it's really extremely useful to to, lead, to study these uh, these things. And I want to mention these two books that were uh, tremendously tremendously useful to me. This one is a hands-on guide that will really get you started easy and fast. And this will justify all the most of the concepts that are uh, discussed in here. So that is it. Now I go back to my own conclusion. Yeah, here it is. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Stefan. I really appreciated your, your lecture. It, it, first of all, it gave us a, a, a nice example how to use an RNA network to make new equipment and new instruments. And of course, I also like a lot of your perspective, which is quite useful. So I don't know if there are some questions uh, or comments. <laughs> So while people, okay, I, I have another comment in the meantime, which is the following. So you use the neural network to do some kind of uh, measurement. So after your experience, uh, you, you think this is really useful or you still thinking that you could do that in another way that it does not use uh, machine learning? So, no, no, no. No, no, never, never again uh, go back to manually process this kind of data for sure. Uh, for sure, that I think it's fantastically useful. There is a huge potential, uh, also because one thing you can one thing you can do is um, train these neural networks with a physical model, so you can run simulations. This is what Gori was doing, but then what you do is you assume that all the physics is kind of captured by your physical model. Here instead, you can really delegate uh, some less relevant parts to the neural networks. And this is the whole point, you know, of, uh, I, I think this is the main point of a hybrid setups uh, like we are all using here. So in many cases, you have a, a data acquisition scheme, then the data is converted to into, into some image, then this image is sent to a composite system, which consists of nonlinear photonics and a part of computer neural network. Here, the same kind of things, except that the hardware is directly in contact with the outside world. But the principle of working is just exactly the same. It's a whole system which is composed of nonlinear photonics and artificial neural networks, and all that operates together. So I think it's a very interesting construction. Um, the only difference with this approach is that here, the hardware part is in direct contact with the open world because we want to make a sensor. Very interesting. but. As another comment, do you think that neural networks are also useful to doing 
I mean, uh, metrology, real measurements. So do you trust a device that uses a neural network and then gives you some measurement that you want? It must be precise. So uh, because you, yeah. a real device, you know what it does, but a neural network, you do not know. It works, but you don't know. So that, that is one critical point, and I don't really know how to address this question, especially because we want to do that in the context of uh, airplane safety. That's one of our main goals. For things. So airplane travel is not fashionable now, but it may come back. And we want to make sure that it works well. And actually, I don't know how to convince a more traditional engineering people that it actually works. Uh, and that is why we train our network on deliberately very simple data so that we can yeah, we see that it, it, it works very well on much, more, much, much more complicated data. And so hopefully it works on any kind of data, but that will be very hard to prove. Yes, I think so. Other comments? Yeah, maybe on uh, just a small comment or question, should uh, education be changed? I mean, when we teach or learn physics, uh, at the moment, physics is different from mathematics. It's overlap hugely. And then we have computer science where people learn about machine learning and that. So should machine learning be actually part of physics education? Because it's a lot of examples that can be provided. It is also probably some, uh, in terms of measurements tools, uh, I believe, yeah. yeah. To be to be honest, my, my take on that is really very, very strong by now. So I have the impression that not learning machine learning right now would be just like not learning to program a computer 30 years ago, or perhaps not learning mathematics a couple of uh, centuries ago. So I, I really think it's uh, teaching that is is very, very important. Because uh, the, the question which was asked, of course, when you go to driverless car, or planes, this criticality of decisions made is, is huge because you just cannot make mistakes. Uh, but uh, in a sense, uh, your example is very good. So when, when you have programming, so you also can make mistakes. And basically you can uh, yes, get results which you will use for wrong decisions. In this sense, maybe machine learning is not that different. Uh, the, the only missing point is uh, sort of, uh, yes, evaluation so, and uh, proof that... Not, moreover, there, there are uh, further, further refinement that can be done. So you, you see here that uh, I use, uh, as this approach, I use a regression approach. So I take my data and I want a number. But I have no uncertainty of this, on this number. And there, is a, there are easy ways where you can convert that to a number with an uncertainty. You, that into a classification problem so you want to say did I move between 0 and 1, 1 and 2, 2 or 3. This is a classification and then you can balance these classifiers such that uh, actually it's possible to have a confidence interval uh, and you know pretty surely where it ended up. This is one of the steps we want to do for the airplane thing. So <laughs> become more trustable by providing error bars. Okay, so if no other, other comments, I want to thank Stefan for his very nice uh, presentation. Uh, thanks for contributing at this, at this event. So I also want to, uh, to thank again the, the speakers, uh, all the speakers of this uh, session, and obviously all the speakers of the school. So we are going to finish. So now I will leave the, the thanks again, Stefan, and we leave the, the word to my, to my colleagues. I thank my colleagues for helping me in, uh, in organizing this conference, which was really a complicated story within this uh, online, uh, online situation. I would also like to have some comment from the attendees, from the participants, from students that, that wants to, to share uh, their ideas. If they want, they are free to 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 make questions and talk if they want. And uh, my final impression is that I was really um, satisfied about the, all the the school because I, I've seen a lot of different talks, ranging from uh, fundamental uh, topics to very applica uh, applicative perspectives. And and I also see thinking uh, as as a student 
in some sense that this is a really a new field uh, in which there are so many ideas. And, uh, and as a student, I would say <laughs> that this is a very good uh, field to work with because you can work on photonics, you can learn machine learning, you can do programming, you can be in touch with real applications. So I think it's a very exciting uh, direction. So I leave the, the other, for other, I leave the space for other comment to my, to my colleagues and the students if they want. So thanks to everybody for participating, by the way. Well, I, I think the students cannot speak. <laughs> they no, they can <laughs> just chat and then I... I we invite them, them, but then switch off. <laughs> yes, they can chat if they want. <laughs> But they That's can, how uh, democracy works. <laughs> <laughs> In Russia, especially. In Russia. <laughs> okay, now, in fact, I, the, maybe the first comment I want to make is uh, I am really shocked uh, and I want to appreciate, I want to, to thank uh, the students because uh, I have been, uh, I think we will have official numbers, but I've been monitoring the number of participants and it has been always uh, very high. I mean, and the, of course, uh, maybe the first days was uh, slightly higher. After five days, uh, people get tired and have other stuff to do. But uh, it, it's remarkably high, considering that all lectures are, uh, go, are recorded. So I think in yeah. uh, the question is that in conferences, uh, pro at least uh, that's how online conferences, uh, that's how what happened with me is that uh, I started maybe to follow the first day or a few talks and then uh, I said, okay, I can listen to them later uh, and then I never do. So for me, it's a disaster. I am not able to, to participate uh, to an online conference as, uh, as I do to a real one because a real one, you are there and uh, you're there all the time and uh, you are sort of uh, embedded into the, the place and uh, the atmosphere. Uh, so I'm really surprised and I think it's an extremely good uh, result, the, the high participation uh, live and also every talk had many questions and very, very, I mean, uh, very deep questions. Uh, most of them I couldn't understand them. They were so deep <laughs> and so specific. And so this means that the students are really specialists and uh, so that uh, a, couple of, a couple of remarks uh, uh, that are really, I think, that among the, the the most important results of this uh, of this game of this experience. Next time we should make one day when students give lectures. Yes, and, yes. and we ask questions and, and see who will win. Well, well in, <laughs> in a previous uh, Como School, we had the poster session already. That uh, of course you cannot do it online. <laughs> that is very important. We always had the poster sessions, and. Uh, Roundtable discussions again that is difficult to do online, and uh, definitely we should uh, maybe even in the next school uh, dedicate half a day to students to give a short uh, five minutes presentations, for example, mm -hmm. instead of a poster. That, uh, that I like the format uh, when uh, there are posters, but you still give one three minutes invitation to your poster and you explain why people should go there. Yes. It, yes. It's really some art to say everything in a very short manner. And also in another school, uh, uh, not all of them, but one uh, I organized in Como, we even had uh, an examination at the end, which uh, uh, most of stu many students participated, maybe 50%, uh, but uh, so there was, uh, uh, the, the lecturers uh, formulated the questions and the students uh, gave their answers. And uh, that, uh, that was also a good uh, exercise, I think. Uh, that permitted the students to have a certificate uh, saying that they passed uh, the examination and uh, to get credits, because I think to obtain credits is necessary to have an examination in the end, to get formal uh, European credits. We, we, we certainly have already ideas for the next uh, workshop, but why don't we ask all participants what they would uh, like to have as topics of the next, and then compare with our ideas. Uh, and how, how they can uh, respond, I mean... Uh, I don't know, we can, we can probably send some email or chat, chat probably too short notice, but so may, maybe concluding emails. Again, it, this does not mean that we will follow all advice, but it will be interesting to see statistics and 
What, uh, some feedback about, uh, first of all, yes, it's very important, uh, maybe not uh, live now in this moment, but if uh, students uh, will send us some, uh, or even what we could do, even better, we could uh, prepare a short questionnaire that yeah, we send yeah. to everybody and people are free to... I, we, have, we have a comment from Oliver uh, Nail, uh, if the pronunciation, so maybe Oliver can, can also speak if he wants uh, to, to comment. <clears throat> Do you want to speak, Oliver? <laughs> you are allowed Hi to. There. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. No, I just wanted to say thank you for putting together the event. It's been a really informative week. Um, and I think that one of the, the great takeaways from this is actually that we can run an event that has such sort of good online accessibility um, and allow people from completely different locations, maybe not able to travel, uh, to attend and sort of uh, contribute. So I think that, that would be a great thing to see carry forward into in-person events in the future. Um, the one thing I would suggest is actually uh, benefiting from platforms like, um, I don't know if you've come across Gather Town, but there's, there's different software platforms that allow for sort of more one-on-one -on -one communication and for sort of interactive poster sessions and that kind of thing. So if there are future online events, then that might be something to consider. Um, but no, that's, mm -hmm. that's everything. So thank mm -hmm. you again. Yes, can, I, can I just respond quickly? Yes, we had the option to have a more interactive Zoom session, not like a webinar, but where everybody appears. But we, it is only possible for less than 100 participants. And we had almost 100 registered participants. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it could be uh, when you have so many online participants, it's a little bit uh, difficult to manage uh, so many when everybody. Uh, can speak simultaneously. But uh, my suggestion is that, uh, in fact, we should consider, even, even if we do it uh, on site next time, uh, it would be good uh, to, to keep uh, the option of doing a mixed uh, event. So to, to, part to, to, to allow uh, re remote uh, students to attend, even though the event will be in common. Yes, in the meantime, Keshav has suggested that we should consider machine learning in nanophotonics, silicon photonics, and metamaterials for us, uh, new topics in the future. And I think these are very, very important. Uh, uh, yes, we should consider that. Roberto, do you have some comments, some suggestions? Yes, thank you, Claudio. Actually, I'm one of the person that uh, benefited most uh, on the on the online uh, lectures because uh, not only the time difference, but also uh, in, in Canada, is, uh, it's a very uh, busy week for many administrative reasons, as I mentioned before. And, you know, the school was moved and there was not expecting. And uh, I would also like to thanks uh, Chiara for having done uh, all this work. Yes. And uh, maybe it's a superfluous because I'm a bit slow learner, uh, actually. But I realized that uh, when you project the lectures, you can go to the next uh, three hours uh, by clicking on the arrow near the play, uh, just in case for people like me that uh, uh, didn't realize that. And uh, I would say that, of course, it's much better to participate online. But uh, these lectures are very beautiful, very useful, and uh, you, know, you can also follow them uh, later on which also agree with uh, what Stefano said, because I think it would be nice to have a format in the future in which the people that can travel to Como will have access to the, uh, to the live lesson, but the other people can benefit from the uh, recorded, uh, recorded uh, lectures. And actually I think that was uh, very well done by the organizer. And I would also like to, to thank Claudio, Sergei, and Stefan and Benjamin, uh, to have uh, helping me and taking uh, the place in chair in the session because uh, again for me it was a bit uh, of a uh, uh, difficult time but I hope uh, next uh, next uh, school will be live and will be in a period that is a bit more relaxed so thank you very much to everybody you're welcome in the meantime we have a comment from Gary so I, I cannot miss Gary speaking so please Gary tell that's tell you if you have a microphone ready. Uh, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. No, I just wanted to, to, to thanks for the organization. I mean, it, it's really 
great, great event you guys have organized and given the circumstances, I know this is, this can be a little bit tricky and a lot of hassle. And, and I, I also found really remarkable the, the quality and the diversity of the talks. I mean, it, it was amazing that what, 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 what you were able to assemble in, in this kind of a short short time frame. So, so I hope that you can really make this event recurrent in the coming years, because I, I, I feel like, like most of you probably is that machine learning will become more and more important for, for what we are doing. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and I think if we can sort of make this, this knowledge uh, or diffuse this knowledge more and more for the younger students in, in the coming years, that would, that would be really fantastic for them, I think. Just like Stefan mentioned, this, this has to be including in, the, in their curriculum at, at some level in the coming years. Uh, mm -hmm. The only thing that I missed was to have a beer with you guys at the, at the end of the day. <laughs> That'd be nice to discuss new ideas, collaborations and, and, and whatnot. But uh, I hope maybe next time <laughs> when this whole mess is over. Yes. <laughs> but thanks a lot. It, it, it was really wonderful. Thank you, Gary. We also have a comment from Stanley. So I, I'm, I'm, I really love to make people contribute by their voice. So please, Stanley, tell us your, your opinion if you want. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I just I want to thanks for the organization because I enjoy all the talks. I watch every one of those. And it was really, I mostly like the ones that I was not from my field. <laughs> I really like this interdisciplinary and this is quite becoming more and more common nowadays. And I wish I would, could go, I would like to go to Como because Como was one of the first places that we had the chaotic conferences in the 60 decade, decades. And we are all working these nonlinear dynamic systems. So it would be quite a good experience to, to be there. But I was able to enjoy on my own time all the, the conference. So I'm really, just want to say thanks. Thanks a lot to you for your uh, appreciation and, and for following all the all the lessons. And we have also uh, Tigers Junuzzi. Oh, oh, I don't, I'm not sure about the name. Do you want to say something? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you for the the effort put in in this great school. It actually gave us a very wide perspective and uh, on these emerging fields. And um, I just wanted to, to make a, a quick suggestion that uh, f uh, in order to make um, students to interact more and maybe uh, to, to ask more questions, I think it can be useful to, to create at the end of the day um, a slot where you can have a direct um, speech with the, the speaker of the days. And you can actually ask, for, for example, doubts or comments on your current work and uh, and so it can be uh, an, a more interactive uh, discussion on emerging uh, works of, of ours of us for example for me as a student and so on so this is my suggestion i think it can be very useful to to interact more but Generally, I, I, I very appreciate. I appreciate a lot uh, the school, and thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the for the being. I, I think it's a very good comment because uh, well, uh, sometimes I, I had to leave and then enter, and when I entered, uh, it was uh, through normal participant, and I felt isolated. I have not seen, I don't know much that. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, yeah so it think... should be some, uh, even in virtual conferences, should be some time when, yes, everybody can show up, speak, and yes, a little bit of chaos at the end. We could create a blog, especially if we think to make it recurrent, we could create a Facebook page, for example, where people can uh, connect and become friends and, uh, and create a community. I think we should have a goal to make it in person next year. Yes, that's, that's true. But, that's but we time. can also be smarter <laughs> in, 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 for example, there's Slack, some, some conference use, use Slack, yes. but the, it, it is not spread enough to make uh, everybody confident with this uh, kind of new tools, but for sure. We, we need to be better, we need to do better. Okay, thanks again to everybody. I do not see other comments, so let me say hello, bye bye, and see you next conference. Yeah. And bye bye. Cool. Next to school. Bye.
Thank you. Bye, gentlemen. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks a lot. lot. Thanks really, a lot. Bye -bye. really. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.